Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Today is January 7th, 2018. This is uh, Sunday, the baptism of our Lord. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning as we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. What this means is that now, even though we still have the nativity scene up in the Christmas tree, uh, baptism of our Lord means that the Christmas season is now over. The readings of Jesus as an infant are over. And now we begin in Jesus' public ministry. And uh, the first uh, days and months and so forth of that public ministry when he was yet to have become popular. Uh, so that is what uh, today means. Before we begin, we have a special order. And that is the installation of our council for this calendar year 2018. So at this time, I would ask that the uh, members of council please come forward. Yes. 
sin against you and thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we will like your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who was rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We now begin our worship with Baptized in Water, hymn number 456, in the back of your worship. Hymn number 456. <coughs> St. John's Lutheran Church, we're singing our entrance hymn, Baptized in Water. This is in honor of the baptism of Jesus. We're celebrating the festival today of the baptism of Jesus. Yesterday was the Epiphany, uh, when we celebrated the wise men coming to praise Jesus, to give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That was yesterday, the Epiphany. Today is the baptism of our Lord, January 7th, 2018. And we're singing this beautiful hymn, Baptized in Water, it's written in 1932, and it's in honor of the Festival of Baptism of Jesus, and also commemorating that we're cleansed by the blood of Christ our King as we're baptized in water. Heirs of Salvation. And this is a Jubilate hymn. It's a uh, Augsburg Fortress, a Gaelic tune. So sing along with us, Baptized in Water.
let us pray. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit that we may follow after your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we listen to the reading of God. Jamie Gibson will be doing the readings. The first reading today is Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. While a wind from God swept over the face of the waters, then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Here is the first reading. about baptism. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I 
I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. You may be seated. What announcement, and that is, please, if you purchased a poinsettia, Please take them home or take it home today. Uh, after today, the point does will be taken out of the sanctuary and placed downstairs for anyone who wishes uh, to take it. So if you purchase the point that uh, after the service, please take it home with Now I ask that you give your attention to our <coughs>
look at themselves and examine their situation and see if there are changes that they want to make in the new year. Or see if there are things that they want to do that they haven't done. Or try something that they haven't tried before. Depending on where you are in your station in life. And so the new year brings this idea of newness. We have a new start, a new opportunity. And the same is in our gospel lesson for today, the baptism of our Lord Jesus. Jesus has been silent for 30 years, according to what scholars tell us. After his birth, we hear little about Jesus. He's taken to the temple at eight days old, circumcised, officially given the name Jesus. We don't hear about him again until at 12 years old on the trip Passover to Jerusalem. He is in the temple and his parents leave, not realizing he's not with them. And then after saying that he must be in his father's house, there's nothing more about Jesus until his baptism. And so his baptism represents for Jesus a new beginning. He is now living that life, that life of, being, of quietness, that life of being unknown. Most scholars think that what Jesus did from 12 to 30 was he learned the carpenter's trade from his stepfather Joseph. When his stepfather passed away, then Jesus took over the carpenter's trade and provided for Mary, the mother of our Lord, and the rest of the family through continuing the trade of the carpenter. At his baptism, God is now calling him to his true mission. He is now sending him forth on the reason for which he was brought to this world in the first place. And that was to bring salvation to the world. Not to condemn the people, but that the people might be saved from him. And so as Jesus begins this new challenge, that of fulfilling the role of the anointed one, the Messiah, it also gives to the church an opportunity to examine itself gives the church an opportunity to take a look at where is it. And in this new year, what should be its priorities? And so to understand what should be our priority, what should be the new watchword for the new year, I invite you to turn with me to the second letter of Paul to Timothy and to the fourth chapter. Paul is knowing that his life is about over, uh, for after the verse we are going to read as our text, we have his famous comment about he has fought the good fight, he's finished the race, and that he has kept the faith. He knows his martyrdom is coming quickly. So he wants to make sure Timothy understands his responsibilities as a bishop of the church, in the area where he is, and understands the responsibilities of the church. And so as we turn to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, we read the fifth verse, where St. Paul writes, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. As for you, always be sober-minded, this means to be calm, to be temperate, and to be alert. That as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be calm in the times of a calamity. We are to be calm in the times of disruption. We are to be calm in the times of disagreement. We are to be temperate, and we are to always be alert. Alert for what? Alert for opportunity to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For that is what the rest of the instruction has to do with. Endure suffering. That means the willingness to suffer on behalf of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not talking about suffering from some kind of disease or suffering from some kind of ailment or suffering from some kind of injury. It means suffering on behalf of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Suffering loss of job, suffering, loss of status in society, loss of property, loss of faith, 
loss of friends, whatever. We are to endure that suffering on behalf of sharing the good news of the gospel with others. Do the work of an evangelist means that uh, let your work be evangelistic in character. In other words, that everything that your church does should be an attempt to bring non-believers into the church. That everything the church does should have at its motivation sharing the good news with others. Uh, the word also means to be ever reaching out to lost souls. That's something we don't hear about much very often nowadays. Lost souls used to be a big emphasis in the church because that's a church's job to reach out to lost souls. But for some reason, in the latter part of the 20th century, in the beginning of this 21st century, a lot of these mainline Protestant churches rarely ever mention the word lost souls. It also means to um, always be a bearer of good news. To always be a bearer of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is Paul telling the church? What St. Paul is telling Timothy and telling us as modern day followers of Jesus Christ is that evangelism is another word that should be a good word in the life of the church. Again, in the next month, be 40 years of ordained ministry, I have seen the word evangelism go from something constantly discussed and talked about to a word now that seems to have a bad connotation. That people in the church don't want to talk about evangelism. But evangelism is a good word. Because first of all, it speaks of us obeying the Great Commission. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he brought his disciples together and other followers, and in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, he gave them this command. Go therefore into all nations. Notice, all nations. Doesn't matter what their historical religious beliefs were. Doesn't matter who brought what religion to them centuries ago. We are to go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us, for lo, he is with us all to the end of the age. That is the commission of the church. That is the work of the church. And yet, in the modern day church, we have seemed to have forgotten that, unless we're talking about people overseas. Now we're great at sending missionary, missionaries to Africa and Asia, to the Pacific Islands, and to other areas of the world where Jesus is not known. But at home, where every year the percent of people who are unchurched, the percentage of people who do not confess Jesus Christ as Lord is growing, we seem to have forgotten that great commission. It is a good word because it means snatching sinners from the jaws of hell. Again, that is what you used to hear about in the church all the time. That we want to snatch sinners from the jaws of hell. Because as Jesus tells us, if you don't believe in it, then when the feast comes, the man at the door won't know you. And you will be thrown out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so it is our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to snatch those sinners out of the jaws of hell by sharing with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And the third reason it is a good word is it speaks of growing churches. Growing churches. Not churches being stable, not churches being at a certain point, but growing churches. And when I say growing churches, we're talking about growing evangelistically, not growing by simply shuffling believers from one church to another. For example, I grew up in Louisville, Jefferson County. We had something like 33 schools, high schools, 
in Jeff again. There were so many pupils that were eligible to go to those 33 high schools. And the high schools differed in population, depending on where they were. Now, if you moved from Fairdale High School to Pleasure Ridge Park High School, Jefferson County educational system hadn't gotten a new student. It's just Pleasure Ridge Park High School got a new student. But it was still, you were still a Jefferson County student. It's the same way when people move from a congregation to a congregation for whatever reason. That's not evangelism. That's not real growth. There are X amount of members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and there are X amount of congregations. And when you move from one congregation to another, that does not increase the membership of the ELCA or the Southern Ohio Senate. You've already been counted. It's just you got a new mailbox address. You're not living in the old home. You're not living. Evangelism is bringing someone in who has never been a member of the church. Or maybe they were a member way back when they were five years old and grandma would take them to church every Sunday and then grandma passed away and you didn't go to church anymore. Evangelism is bringing a backslider to the church. But evangelism is not simply absent from one congregation to another for whatever reason. So the word talks about growing churches. Like Africa, where we're told a thousand people a day convert to the Christian faith. Imagine a thousand a day. We need some of those people to come over here. So we can get a thousand Americans a day converted to the Christian faith. So that is why evangelism is a good word. It demands work. If we're involved in evangelism, it involves every member of the church. There's no standing on the sidelines. There's no Monday morning quarterback. There's no couch coaching. It calls for an end to spectator Christianity. And unfortunately, that is what we have too much of in America today. Spectator Christianity. People coming to a church to worship, but they don't want to be asked to do anything. And I think that's a reason why some of these mega churches are as big as they are. Because you join a mega church, there's 5,000 people before they get to you. So you can go on Sunday and not worry about being asked to serve on the council or to serve on some committee, or to sing in the choir, or to clean up on clean up day on Saturday, or help with the pantry, or the thrift store, or the rainbow table, or whatever else is going on in the congregation. Join a mega church, and unless you put yourself forward, nobody's going to know who you are. And so evangelism puts an end to spectator Christianity. It brings us back to the early centuries of the church, where the church spread not by St. Peter and St. Paul and the other apostles. It spread by people who became Christian telling their family members or their co-workers or the people in their neighborhood or the people they did recreation with telling them to come and see. Telling them that we have found what we have been looking for. The assurance of the forgiveness of our sins and the promise and assurance of everlasting life. That is not something every religion can say. Because you have to earn it. But in Christianity, it's God's free gift of grace. And so we put an end to spectator Christianity and the word calls for evangelism to be the new watchword of the year. To be the priority of the current. And again, as I say, when we do things to do them to reach out to the end church, not just to satisfy that ourselves. And how do we do it? We do it by preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and Christ was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. That is what we share with people. Letting them know that the burden no longer is on them. They don't have to worry about doing things to make me right with God. God has done it all. 
and you just reap the benefits. And so Jesus Christ crucified, as St. Paul said, is what the church is to preach. Over the Christmas vacation, I was in a conversation with a member of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, and we were talking about the differences and the emphasis between the ELCA and the Missouri Synod. And a person made the comment that when social activism or social agenda becomes the most important thing in the church, instead of preaching Jesus Christ crucified, that church is in a terrible state. And I agree with that. St. Paul says we preach Jesus Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and a folly to Gentiles. Because it's God at work, not humanity. If we created, were creating God, there would be all kinds of things we have to earn and do for salvation. But God doesn't act like we do. And it is preaching Jesus Christ crucified, the forgiveness of sins, the promise of everlasting life that is supposed to be preached by the church. Not social conflicts and agendas. A friend of mine, a friend of mine and genius actually, uh, were members of Hopeful when I served a Hopeful Lutheran Church in Florence. And then after we left, uh, they ended up not liking the new pastor that came in, so they transferred to another Lutheran church. And our friends and the pastor of that church were exact opposites as far as politically and socially. But the pastor, although they might, she might put a bumper sticker on her car as to who she was voting for, never from the pulpit preached sermons about you have to vote this way or you have to think this way or you have to be for this. She preached Jesus Christ crucified. Well, she retired. New pastor came in. This was back in the fall when we were having all the up people after Charlottesville. And all this suddenly about anything doing with the old South had to be torn down and pushed out of sight and so forth. And that very first Sunday, the pastor's sermon was, and my friend says he cannot ever remember this pastor's given a sermon text, never mentioned Jesus in the whole sermon, never mentioned the Holy Spirit, never mentioned anything else. All he did for 25 minutes was harangue those who were members of the NRA or believed in the right to carry a gun and to criticize and make fun of those who were defending the right to keep up statues to the Confederate heroes from the war between the states. One of the members, a state trooper of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, got up in the middle of the sermon and walked out. Our friends waited it out to the end of the sermon, but they've never been back. And now they're going to Missouri Senate congregation where they say they never hear the preacher talk about social agenda or politics. It's always Jesus Christ crucified. That's what evangelism does. It preaches Jesus Christ crucified. You don't come to church on Sunday morning, and I don't go to church on a Sunday morning, to hear some preacher tell me how to vote or how to think about different social issues in which you can have, Christians can have legitimate disagreements. And the only time Luther really got involved in a political situation, he put his foot in his mouth and probably wish he'd never written what he had written, and that was during the Peasants' War. And he came out very harshly against the peasants and saying how the princes and kings should stab and kill and butcher the peasants for revolting. Of course, later he was in it. regretted that. But you read his sermons, and he's always talking about Jesus Christ and what it is to believe in Jesus Christ. And what a wonderful thing grace is through God, through faith in Jesus Christ. So we preach the good news of the gospel. We preach it with our lives and our lips. We preach it from the pulpit and the workplace. We preach it by our witness and our walk so that others will see how it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So, why should we do it? Why should we make evangelism a priority?
Why should each one of us make it a priority to share with someone we know is not going to church an invitation to come and worship with us? Well, first of all, have we forgotten that the unrepentant go to hell? Do we care? God does. And if God cares, we should care. St. Peter in his second letter, the third chapter, verse 9 writes, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You hear people say sometimes, oh, God wouldn't send anybody to heaven. God doesn't. As St. Peter explained here, you make the choice. God is being slow is what he's talking about him sending Jesus back because he wants you to have time to repent and to believe in his son because he wants all, he, God, wants all to reach repentance. He wants hell to be empty. Filled with only the devil and his demons. But you have to make that choice. The cross tells us that God cares. And this is an urgent message that must have priority in churches again. That Jesus Christ died to save the world. So what will be the results if we follow St. Paul's instructions to St. Timothy. First is, evangelism will set a church on fire. We see it in Africa. We see it in Asia. We see it in other parts of the world. Evangelism will unite believers. No matter denominational differences, if evangelism is active, those differences don't matter. What matters is that lost souls are being saved. And evangelism will require a new call to new commitment to Jesus Christ. All benefited the church. The church benefits from more and more people joining in and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The church benefits from unity with other brothers and sisters in Christ who worship a little differently. And the church benefits when everyone makes that new commitment to proclaim the good news of the gospel. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now sing the candle on the midnight clear in number 282 in the back. singing and came upon a midnight clear as the Christmas season is drawing to a close and this is the baptism of our Lord. This hymn was written by Edmund H. Sears. He is a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. He's from Massachusetts and he's emphasizing the angels and the midnight clear in which Jesus was born. This is the last time we'll be singing Christmas music and we'll now be emphasizing Jesus' ministry. It was written in 1849.
church, let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from the true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things remain. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was in the of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified like a conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to the Lord to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son, who with the Father and Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the church, the nations, and all who seek the light. Our response today is pure our prayer. Holy God, strengthen and unite your one holy church in its common baptismal life, that your Holy Spirit may empower all the baptized to be light-filled witnesses of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, Protect all who live in regions where the darkness of war and bloodshed threatens to overpower the light of reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of mercy, make us attentive to your spirit who calls us to welcome all into community. Hold the sick among us in your healing hand that they might be restored to wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Spirit of God, Descend upon those who are baptized this day and make them powerful proclaimers of your love. Bless those who are inquiring into the faith, that they too may come closer to your light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, your radiance unites us with our beloved dead. Keep us united with them until that day when we all stand before your unveiled glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our spoken and silent prayers, O God of light, and reveal yourself to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's time for our offering. Our ushers are Carol Blaze and Connie Singleton. Those participating in the service today, this is... January the 7th, 2018, St. John's Lutheran Church, Becky Dimitrov was his worship assistant, Jamie Gibson, reader, Steve Clark, communion assistant, Carol Glaze, and Connie Singleton are the ushers. We're celebrating now the festival, Jesus' baptism. The spirit of baptism is the family of God. Jesus is our brother. We're all members of God's family. God is our Father, and we're praised God for his love that he Jesus died on the cross to save us from sin. We're baptized now into God's family. We had the reading today and emphasizing the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we'll be studying his ministry. This is the close of the Christmas season. We had the gospel. Christ uh, was with us when we were baptized, and he will be with us forever. He was baptized just like we were baptized into God's family. And now we have the watchword for the new year, that's evangelism, and spread God's love. As we do it, whatever we do to the least of these, our brothers and sisters, we do to Jesus Christ. We sang, it came upon the midnight clear, that's the last Christmas carol that we'll be singing until next year. We gave the Nicene Creed, the offering, we had the prayers of intercession. We will now have the great thanksgiving. We receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You'll see the ushers going forward. Remember that the lessons Cindy Pearson have given the flowers 
in honor of Luke Everhart, Mark Everhart, J Jesse Pearson, and Joe Lane for their birthdays. Flowers are also given by Jerry and Phyllis Parker in memory of Marilyn Miller on her birthday. Now getting ready for Holy Communion, the most sacred time we receive Jesus Christ. Jesus is with us, he's here with us, and we are grateful to him, we acknowledge him, and we are glorifying him. We acknowledge his salvation for us.
fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. We conclude our worship with Let All Things Now Living, hymn number 881, in the back of your worship. Hymn number 881. We're now singing a hymn of praise and thanksgiving that all things now living. It was written by Catherine Davis. Catherine Davis lived 1892 to 1980. And this is a hymn that she wrote, praise and thanksgiving. As we have just received the body and blood of Jesus Christ, he will be with us forever. And he is here with us as we believe in the real presence. He's present in the body and in the blood. And we received his body and blood today. And he will be with us in through eternal life. But all things now living. Watching us on YouTube. This is the 7th of January 2018. We're celebrating the baptism of Jesus Christ. We we're baptized with water and the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit and we are baptized just like Jesus was baptized. And we're celebrating that today. It's also the end of the Christmas season. We invite you to come to St. John's Church any Sunday, 8 o'clock service, 10.30 service. Come help us to spread the gospel of love. And as we have done good things to anybody, to any, any of our brethren, we've done it to Jesus. We see the face of Jesus. We see people now are taking the flowers away. Flowers were presented by uh, Gus and Cindy Pearson, and uh, Les and Cindy Pearson, in honor of their birthdays of many of the family members. Flowers are also given by Jerry and Phyllis Cochran. We invite you to come to celebrate Jesus Christ's birth. We invite you to come and celebrate Jesus Christ's presence. The Holy Communion is celebrated first and third Sunday in each month's festivals and every Wednesday evening. We have the wonderful opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. We believe in the real presence. Jesus is really present. He will never leave us. He died on the cross. He instituted Holy Communion, and we will receive Holy Communion as many times as we come. He is here to give it to us. And he is here with us. He is present with us in the sanctuary. He is present with us. We have great respect for Him, and we are worshiping Him today. So come and worship and receive the Holy Spirit in eternal life. <laughs>